Wow, what a beauty. Incredible ancient forest ecosystems like this one here used to stretch from southern Alaska all the way down to northern California, yet today, after almost two centuries of greedy colonial resource extraction in the form of logging, virtually nothing remains of these once great ecosystems. The most intact slivers that exist today are in British Columbia, and despite what you may have heard in the news or catchphrasy government marketing campaigns, much of the last of these forests is still not protected and is still actively being logged right now. So let's take a moment here to break down exactly how much mature forest is left, what's currently happening with it, and where we go from here. So British Columbia is roughly 95 million hectares in size, and though the government lists about 60.3 million of those hectares as forest land, more accurate counts suggest that it's actually around 51.5 million hectares of forest, or just over half the land mass of the province. Of that 51.5 million hectares of forest, 11.1 .1 million hectares is considered to be old growth forest, or about 20%, which sounds like a pretty big chunk, right? Ah, that's marketing for you. Because once we start digging into the nuance and details of these forests, the situation gets pretty dire pretty quickly. But before we do that, we need to define a couple of things. Firstly, there is no universally agreed upon definition of old growth, although governing authorities often define old growth as a forest over 250 years on the coast and 140 years in the interior, though these definitions are quite limited and can vary drastically based on the location and composition of a specific forest and still don't necessarily capture the nuances. For example, a 250-year-old forest is still radically different from a 3,000-year-old forest, and despite structural characteristics that wouldn't even begin to be present in the younger forest, they're both still just considered to be an old-growth forest. A better measure of these forest qualities is site index, which measures the productivity of a forest stand over a 50-year period, though this still doesn't necessarily capture the unique complexities of that forest. With this method, a forest with a site index of 10 means that in a 50-year growing period, you could expect the canopy height of the dominant trees to be about 10 meters tall. Now generally, any forest with a site index of 20 and below is considered to be a low productivity forest, and those with a site index of 20 and above are considered to be high productivity forests. Low productivity forests are generally areas that have nutrient poor soil, short growing seasons, and contain stunted smaller trees such as high alpine areas, bogs, or marshes. High productivity forests, on the other hand, have very rich soils, often in low valley bottoms, and contain big old trees and complex ecological function. These are the forests that you see on tourism ad campaigns and are also the ones that the logging industry likes to target because they contain the best quality timber. Okay, so if we go back to those 11.1 .1 million hectares of old growth remaining in the province, we find that a majority of this is low productivity forest. Of the highest productivity forest that we have in the province, or that with a site index of 30 or more, only 35,000 hectares remains, which is less than 2.7% of its original extent, and makes up 0.05% of all the forest in BC. That's insane, right? Less than 1% of our forests are actually made up of the types of forests that BC is known for and seen all over tourism brochures, thanks to a fiber-hungry industry that is determined to log the very last of it for short-term economic gain, instead of finding ways to do things differently. So, of those 11.1 .1 million hectares of old growth, 3.5 million hectares are protected, most of which is low productivity forest. This includes what's known as old growth management areas, which, contrary to their name, don't actually contain much old growth. A recent survey found that not even 30% of the land in old growth management areas was old growth forest, and half of these areas didn't contain any old growth at all. Ah, marketing. So that leaves 7.6 million hectares of old growth forest unprotected, with 2.6 million hectares defined by the government as not at risk of logging, meaning that it's low productivity, difficult to access, or remote forest. That leaves 5 million hectares at risk of being logged within the next decade. Now, a couple of years ago, the government announced deferrals of 2.6 million hectares of that at-risk 5, in which they would theoretically give the indigenous nations on whose land those forests stood the option to protect them instead of having them logged. However, at the time, the government didn't really engage in any meaningful consultation or conversation with these nations, nor did it have any way to support them in their decision should they choose to protect it. Most of the logging being done on their lands is by colonially established corporations, and they pay the nations a negotiated amount for being able to extract their resources and destroy their lands, even though the nation has absolutely no say in the logging tactics or methods used, and is often legally bound to not speaking out against it. However, this is a source of income that many of these nations rely on after centuries of oppression and genocide at the hands of that very same government now giving them an option to protect these forests, and in many cases, the lack of support available from the government at this time allowed industry to sneak in and offer better, more lucrative, more concrete deals with these nations. 
Grand Chief Stuart Phillips summarized it brilliantly by calling the process consent by coercion, in which many of these nations simply don't have any other alternatives because of the current situation established by the colonial system still in place today. So of those 2.6 million hectares that were open to being deferred, at this point about 1.3 million hectares of that has officially been set aside by many nations to be protected, while the other 1.3 million hectares are set to be logged at the will of those nations who may or may not have had any real choice in the matter. A recently leaked government map, however, showed that as the province's best scientists were defining which of the best forests remaining to defer and protect, the Ministry of Forests was working behind closed doors with the industry to change those maps so that over half the those best forests left were never open for deferrals at all and are still available to be logged. That brings us back to that other 2.4 million hectares of that 5 million that were at risk to logging. You may have been wondering, what's been going on with all of that? Well, the short answer here is nothing. The government has basically just given industry a free pass to log all of that, but only after the Ministry of Forests made sure that it still contained some of the best forests by not including them in the deferrals. Oof. Bet you weren't expecting that spicy little nugget of government corruption, were ya? So now we're looking at the potential to maybe protect 1.3 million hectares of at-risk forests, or a mere 2% of all the forests in British Columbia, should the nations who agreed to the two-year deferral find meaningful ways to protect them with government support. The provincial government, along with the BC Parks Foundation, did recently make $300 million available to the First Nations who wish to protect those forests, and an additional $1 billion from the federal government aims to help them by supporting their ambitious goal to protect 30% of lands and waters by 2030. It's important to note, though, that both of these funding options are one-time allocations meant to protect these forests for around a decade, and at the same time, the province is currently subsidizing the logging industry $365 million every year with your tax dollars, and when you include the carbon offset credits and hydro subsidies they receive, it's around $5 billion annually to the same industry hell-bent on logging the rest of it. So basically, despite the catchy marketing that the government is doing to make you think that everything's fine, that old growth is being protected, it's all just talk, 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 and log, log, log. Now, don't get me wrong, there are many passionate and dedicated folks working within the industry and at a policy level to do all they can, and I commend them for that. But ultimately, the change we need isn't happening at a rate that can compete with the losses we're facing at the hands of the industry. At this point, what we need is a significant shift in policy that changes the way that the Ministry of Forests manages these forest lands so that the biological and ecological values are managed for first and foremost, not solely timber values. This has been something that has been promised multiple times, and legislation for a biodiversity and ecological framework is currently in the works right now, but there's no telling how gutted the final framework will be once the industry lobbyists have their way with it. Beyond that, we desperately need new regulations around the actual methods used in forest management to protect these ecological values and create jobs for our communities, so that no matter who is doing the logging, wherever it may be in the province, it's guaranteed to not be done in a way that creates more mosaics of unnatural disturbance type, scale, and frequency like that which we see today. We need to protect the ecological integrity of the remaining mature stands of old growth forests we have left and transition the industry to a management system that improves the health of that which we've damaged while creating more jobs and stronger communities across a diverse and healthy landscape that is more resistant to the impacts of climate change. So what can you do? Well, I like to think there are many things you can do. I would normally encourage you to call BC Premier David Eby at 250-387-1715 to tell him how important it is to enforce a strong biodiversity and ecological framework. You know, to use your voice and express your opinion civilly in a democracy where every voice matters. Which you're certainly most welcome to do, but I really don't think that guy's listening anymore, and I really don't think that he or the NDP actually care about you or what the people want, nor do they actually have the power to change a system that is so inherently corrupt and broken. So how do you make your voice heard? Well, my short answer here is however you're able to do so, and that looks different for each and every one of us. Maybe focusing on the lower rungs of the political ladder is a good place to start by calling your MLAs and putting pressure on them to put pressure up top, or maybe just running for office yourself. Community is one of the most important things we can surround ourselves with, so maybe getting out and organizing a community awareness event, a sit-in, a boycott, a protest, or something that brings people together for effective action for change. Something huge you can do is support tribal parks and other indigenous-led businesses or conservation efforts while working to decolonize and empower these nations in a constructive way that builds community. You can also reach out to folks with differing perspectives and work to have constructive conversations to find middle ground and work together to create ideas and understanding of one another and where to go forward from here. And then, all things considered, 
There is something to be said about more radical forms of nonviolent action like blockades, which put a hard stop on things to prevent further digression and force conversations about change to happen. There are so, so, so many things we can do, and as daunting and discouraging as it all may be, I implore you to not lose hope and to instead get creative and find new ways to make change happen and to make your voice heard however it's able to be heard.